If uh, you have your Bibles today, you want to open up to Matthew chapter 27, we're going to dive into this new series called Miracles of the Cross, and um, uh, I'm really excited about this as we journey towards Easter together. Uh, I'm just going to kind of put all my cards on the table here up at, up at the beginning of the message and just let you know this Sunday uh, is, is a call to repentance. It's, it's a call for those of us who are saved to allow the Lord to examine our lives and, and uh, to repent of anything we need to. And, and maybe you're here, maybe you're listening, maybe you're out there on, uh, online watching this morning and, and you've never given your life to the Lord, you've never confessed, you've never believed. Uh, man, I pray that today would be the day of repentance for you as we begin our journey towards Easter. How many of you um, have kids or have had kids in your house at some point in your life? Okay, great. So if, if uh, those of you who, who have them now or those of you who had them then, uh, some of y'all are ahead of me in the journey, some of y'all are behind me in the journey, but, but here's where my kids are right now. So my kids have gotten a little bit older and they've come to the age or the place where they absolutely love to trick, tempt, and torture each other. That's the stage we're in right now. They just, they love to do those kinds of things to each other. And this week in my house, there was a vigorous debate happening. And I didn't participate in it. I didn't instigate it. Um, I didn't even end it. I was just over in another part of the house and I was listening to all this happen. Have you ever had one of those conversations, moms and dads, where you got to kind of listen to it, but you, you weren't a part of it at all. And you were just like, wow, those are my kids. So that, that, that happened this week for me. They were having this vigorous debate. One of my kids proposed a very deep, thoughtful question. And I'm going to propose it to you this morning and then ask for your response. The, uh, the, the, the kid just simply said this to all of his siblings. Are there more doors or wheels in the world? Are there more doors or, or wheels in the world? Have you ever thought about that? No, me either. But, but I heard that and it kind of perked my ears up and I was kind of like, oh, that's an interesting question. Well, what would you say? Are there more doors or wheels in the world? How many of you would say there's more doors in the world? Okay, about the same as first service. How many of you would say there's more wheels in the world? Okay, good. Yeah, about the same as first service, maybe 15% say doors and then everybody else is, is wheels. I, 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 I mean, wheels, right? Uh, yeah, everybody else's wills. So I was the same way when I thought about it first, because immediately when you hear the question, your mind jumps to, to two things. It jumps to your car and it jumps to your house. And you think, wow, you know, we have two cars in our family. They each have four wheels. You know, we have one house. Our house only has three doors. So yeah, there's probably more wheels. And plus all the 18 wheelers out there, right? I mean, there's a lot of wheels in the world. But, but as the kids start talking this through, and this is the part where I really get to listen to, this question is really a harder question than it sounds like when you first think about it, right? So at, at first your mind starts thinking about those things, but as you really start processing it, you're like, wow, there's, there's a, a lot more stuff out there that has wheels and doors. Because every vehicle also has doors, right? Two to four doors. So there's more doors there. And then initially you think, well, you know, my house just has a couple of doors. But when you really start to think about it, my kids are bringing these things up. Well, what about the doors on our cabinets? Look, count all those doors. What about the doors to the bathroom? What about the doors to the bedroom? What about the doors to the closets? What about the door to the attic? We can count those doors too. What about all the doors at our school? What about the doors where we work? What about all the doors at the church? One of them said. Your fridge has a door. Your freezer has a door, right? So you, you start really thinking about it. You're like, whoa, well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe there's a lot, lots of doors. Maybe, maybe there are more doors than wheels. And then, and then you, you start to process like, well, I don't know. There's, there's other things. One of my kids brought this up. They said, what about all the advent calendars? You know, the ones with the little chocolate where you open the door? Yeah, one of my kids was like, yeah, there's 16 million, how they know these things, I don't know. I'm quoting children here, you know, so don't hold me to this number. But one of my kids said, there's 16 million of those sold in the United States every year. And then she said, no, no. So that's about 400 million doors. And then you're going, well, I don't know, maybe doors win. And then one of my other kids 
pulls up the tablet and is like, yeah, but, but what about these? What about one of these with all these wheels? They're, those are all over the world, right? And warehouses and shipping places and stuff. You count all those wheels. That's a, that's a lot of wheels. And then one of my other kids is on their tablet and they're like, yeah, but what about places like this? Well, there's a lot of doors. And so this is just going on and on and on. And, and then uh, another one of my kids is like, yeah, but think about all my, my toy cars. They all have wheels too. We got to count those wheels. And then one of the other kids is like, yeah, most of them have doors, <laughs> you know, as well. They're going back and forth like this, back and forth, back and forth. And then one of the girls are like, yeah, what about all the doors on our dollhouse? We have to count those. And so this goes on and on and on. And it, it was just a, a cute, innocent, you know, fun thing to listen to them debate and argue over and present their cases and everything else. Um, but here's the deal. At the end of the day, you know what the answer is? Nobody knows. <laughs> That's what the answer is. There is no possible way to know or figure out the answer to that question. Whether there are more doors or more wheels in the world. Nobody knows. There's no way to quantify it. There's no way to figure it out. It's just absolutely impossible. And I tell you that for a purpose. Because over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about miracles of the cross. And, and I've been doing a deep dive into miracles this spring. I've been working on a, a new Bible study curriculum that will be published this fall uh, on miracles of the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament. And I've just been immersing myself in, in miracles from Genesis to Revelation, just trying to learn everything I can about them and studying them deeply. And, and I was thinking about this leading into this series. I, I want to present this to you because there's, there's this funny thing that happens when we talk about miracles. Everybody runs to their camps. And, and there's extremes when it comes to miracles and, and these camps that we take. And, and what I can tell you from my own journey, spending the last few months just really studying miracles of the Bible and putting a lot of time and energy and effort into that, is I've come to this place in my life when it comes to the miracles of the Bible where I am content sometimes in just not knowing. Content in just not knowing what the answer is. Content in just knowing sometimes God's miracles are mysteries too. Sometimes we see just a glimpse of the miracle uh, on the surface, but we can't truly understand what the big purpose behind the miracle was. And, 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 and I would just encourage you as we begin this process of going through these miracles of the cross, to, to not let yourself come to a place where many people come to whenever we preach and teach about miracles. When we get to these mysterious things, sometimes um, people just come to this place where all they want to do is argue and fight and criticize and critique and send me emails questioning my motives and my meanings and, and, and all these other things. Can I just tell you, that just like we don't know how many doors or how many wheels there are in the world, not everything in these miracles can be answered. Not everything in these miracles can be covered in 25 or 30 minutes. And so I would encourage us to not be like my children, amen? Like, let's not get into hopeless, senseless, useless arguments like, like children, but instead, let us be focused on just coming to the feet of our Father, knowing that He's the master of the miracle, and knowing that He can speak into our hearts what we need to learn from the miracle, amen? All right, Matthew 27, 45 through 49, the first miracle from the cross. It says, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the whole land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling for Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a stick and offered him a drink. But the rest said, let's see if Elijah comes to save him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the whole land. That is the first miracle that happens as Jesus hangs on the cross for the sins of the world. There are only three things we have time to cover this morning in regards to this miracle. 
The first one is this, point number one on your outline, on your app, whatever you're taking notes in is this, the symbol. We need to understand the symbolism behind this particular miracle when it comes to light and darkness. There's, there's a great symbol here that's carried from Genesis all the way through Revelation. Light and darkness are frequently used as symbols by God to show two primary things. Darkness is primarily used to symbolize and show God's judgment. And light is typically used, generally used, to symbolize and show God's grace. The Bible tells us that Jesus was born in the darkness of night in a little place called Bethlehem. And on that beautiful night, in that little forgotten village, God's grace was revealed as Jesus, our Messiah, bursts onto the world stage in the typical fashion, being born to Mary and Joseph. And as a symbol of this grace coming into the world, we see light appear in the middle of the night. In Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 9, it says, In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields, keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. This light in the middle of the night that shone around the angels who had come to proclaim the good news that the Messiah was born lit up the night, and that is a sign and a symbol of God's grace, right? God's glory. The wise men themselves followed a light a single star in the sky to come and present their gifts to Jesus following their birth. We read about that in places like Matthew chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, for the sake of time. After hearing the king, they went on their way, and there it was, the star, the light, the sign of God's grace, God's deliverance. The star they had seen at its rising, and it led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. Notice when they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. Because they saw that as a sign and a symbol of God's grace and God's deliverance and God bringing the Messiah into the world. Speaking of Jesus, John talks about the light. In John 1, 4 through 9, it says, In him was life, and that light was the that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about something, to testify about the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And more than once, Jesus himself declares and speaks of himself as being the light of the world. For the sake of time, I'll just share John chapter 8, verse 12. Jesus spoke to them again. I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. So I paint this picture for you because I, I, I think there's significance here in this symbol. Jesus is born in the dead of night, and at his birth, it's marked by light. The glory of the Lord fills the night's darkness with light as a sign of his grace. And here in our text, Jesus is about to die in the middle of the day, and the world will be covered by darkness. He's born in the middle of the night, and the world is lit up. He dies in the middle of the day, and the world becomes dark. In Mark 15, 25, it tells us that the crucifixion started at 9 a.m. Three hours have passed, so now the noonday sun is high above the planet. This is the time of the day when it is the brightest. The sun is shining at its strongest. It is intense. And yet the scripture declares darkness came over the whole land. People have tried to explain this darkness. They've tried to explain this darkness away 
in different ways. Some have said, for example, that this is a, a reference only to spiritual darkness. It has nothing to do with an actual physical darkness or with physical light at all. It's just it's purely spiritual. Others say this is just a natural, occurring, regularly scheduled eclipse, like you've probably seen in your lifetime and witnessed. It's, it's just an eclipse. That's what happened. I, I will tell you, I am fully convinced that this was a supernatural miracle of God. And, and here's why. I, as you dive into the details, you can't, you can't come to any other conclusion. It, it either has to be a lie or it has to be a miracle. Because the Greek word used here for land or whole land, which I think is a great translation, by the way, the word here used for land is a word that is almost exclusively used to describe both inside the Bible and outside the Bible in the Greek. It's a word that's used to describe the whole earth. In other words, the scripture is saying that the entire world was dark for three hours. Now, while an eclipse can bring darkness to some parts of the world, it, it never brings darkness to the whole earth. If you're right in the center of an eclipse, it, it's not even what I would call true darkness, but it gets pretty dark, right? We've all seen an eclipse. But here's what you have to know about an eclipse. Even if you're in the middle of the darkest part of the eclipse, the part where you see the full eclipse, where it's at its darkest, is only 165 miles wide on the earth. That's why people travel to go see eclipses, because you can't see it from the same place in the same way. It's why a lot of times when there's an eclipse, you only see a partial eclipse. So it couldn't have been the whole world if it was just an eclipse, right? The other thing is that a full eclipse, or any eclipse, is measured in minutes, not hours. Seconds, really. The darkness never lasts for three hours in an eclipse. In fact, it's, it, it's moving the entire time. I mean, you've got to be ready. It, you can't just be like, oh, well, I'll catch it at two o'clock, you know? Like, like it, it happens when it happens. You either see it or you don't. It, it passes by quickly. Finally, we, we know from places like Joshua 10 and 2 Kings 20, that God can supernaturally manipulate the sun. This, this isn't the first time something like this would happen in Scripture, and you can go read about those miracles in the Old Testament if you want. For, for more evidence, I, I would point you to two early church fathers. One is uh, named Origen, the other is Tertullian. You've probably heard of him more than the former. But both of these early church fathers offer multiple extra-biblical evidence to this being a worldwide event, a worldwide event of darkness. They, they both offer evidence that is recorded and reported to have come from people who were not followers of Christ, who were living in different parts of the world. They weren't in Jerusalem when this happens. And, and they reported there being a three-hour period of darkness on this day. There's also a letter that was written from uh, Pilate to Emperor Tiberius, sometime after the crucifixion, that referred to the darkness. And there's a letter that Tiberius wrote back to Pilate saying that this three-hour or extended period of darkness had been experienced in Rome on the day Jesus died. Rome is a long way away, more than 165 miles. But here's the main reason we know this is a sign and a symbol from God, not just an eclipse. You can literally rewind the tape on the universe... God designed it all in such a wonderfully magnificent way. It works with such precision. You can fast forward a hundred years and figure out what time the sun will come up and set. It is, it is that precise. You can do the same thing in reverse. You, there are computer programs that do this, but you can rewind the tape. To this, John MacArthur writes... But a normal astronomical eclipse would have been impossible during the crucifixion because the sun and the moon were far too far apart on that day. This was indeed a supernatural symbol, a supernatural sign, a supernatural miracle that God performed for the whole earth to see because he is trying to get their attention. It was a miracle that everyone saw, but you know what? Almost everybody missed. It was a miracle that 
everybody saw, but nobody really got. And this is one of the scariest things about miracles as I've been studying them and reading them. It's totally possible to see it and even experience it like all of these people around the crucifixion did and to miss it or miss the point of it. The second thing I see in this miracle is the substitution. We're going to talk more about this next week. But the substitution that is symbolized in this darkness has to be discussed. There are many different theories on why God chose to do this miracle, this miracle of darkness. Some say that um, it, was, it was a sign from God to display his, his judgment on the world for killing his son. And certainly it, it can be that because darkness is often used, as we're fixing to see, uh, in a way to express judgment. Others say that it was God covering the nakedness of Jesus. But because before he was crucified, he was brutally tortured, he was stripped of all of his clothing, he was, he was nailed to the timber naked to be humiliated. And some, some say that God was covering the nakedness of Jesus so he wouldn't have to endure that shame during that time. Still others claim that this is nature itself groaning and crying out in pain as Jesus, the creator and sustainer, is laboring for the spiritual life of all creation as he bears the sins of the world. The list goes on and on with these theories, and and they may be right in part or in whole. I don't know. I I try my best not to make assumptions. I I try my best not to to read more into the text than than is actually there. I try to just say, Lord, Lord, what, what is this? What can I see? What can I understand? And with everything else, I'm just content knowing you're the master of the miracle. But here's what the Bible tells us. Darkness is frequently used to mark divine judgment. We see it by the prophets in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 30, for example, says, On that day they will roar over it like the roaring of the sea. When one looks at the land, there will be darkness and distress. Light will be obscured by clouds. The prophet Joel says in Joel 2, 1 and 2, Blow the ram's horn in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the residents of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. In fact, it is near a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and total darkness. Like the dawn spreading over the mountains, a great and strong people appears, such as never existed in ages past and never again will in all generations to come. Amos 5.20 Won't the day of the Lord be darkness rather than light, even gloom without any brightness in it? Zephaniah 1, 14 and 15, the great day of the Lord is near, near and rapidly approaching. Listen, the day of the Lord. Then the warrior's cry is bitter. That day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of destruction and desolation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and total darkness. Peter said it this way in 2 Peter 2, 4, for if God didn't spare the angels who sinned, but cast them into hell and delivered them in chains of utter darkness to be kept for judgment. Jude chapter six, uh, Jude verse 6, The angels who did not keep their own position but abandoned their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains in deep darkness for the judgment on the great day. Darkness is often referred to and pointed at and symbolizes God's judgment. Likewise, you can go to Matthew chapter 8, Matthew chapter 22, and Matthew chapter 25 and see that darkness is connected with the judgment of God. So, while the world is now immersed, submerged into this physical darkness, Jesus is enduring extreme spiritual darkness as he becomes the substitute for your sins and mine. Indeed, The darkness that covered the whole world symbolizes Jesus taking the sins of the whole world upon himself. Of this passage, Wolverd and Zuck write in their commentary, In this period of darkness, Jesus became the sin offering for the world, and as such was forsaken by the Father. Near the end of this period of time, Jesus could bear the separation no longer, and thus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Paul explained it like this to the Corinthians 
2 Corinthians 5.21, He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Peter said it like this in 1 Peter 2, 24 and 25. He himself bore our sins and his body on the tree, so that having died to sin, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but you have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. You see, in the middle of this miracle of darkness, there is a symbol of the miracle of divine substitution taking place as well. Jesus was put in your place and my place, took your sins and my sins so that we could live. I feel like McDonald says it the best. The first time I read these words, I wept. And in all honesty, the second, third, fourth, and fifth time I read them, I wept. I've had to practice just so I can get through it. In those three hours were compressed the hell which we deserved. The very wrath of God against all our transgressions. We see it only dimly. We simply cannot know what it meant for him to satisfy all of God's righteous claims against sin. We only know that in those three hours, he paid the price. He settled the debt, and He finished the work necessary for man's redemption. Finally, point number three, I see the stubbornness, the absolute stubbornness of man. I see the stubbornness of those who condemn Jesus to die. I see the stubbornness of those who cried, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. I see the stubbornness of those who who cast lots for his clothing. I see the stubbornness of those who nailed him to the timber. I see the stubbornness of those who spat in his face. I see the stubbornness of those who swung the whip. I see the stubbornness of those who pressed the thorns into his brow. I see the stubbornness of those who mocked him. I see the stubbornness of those who laughed at him. I see the stubbornness of those who tormented him all the way to and while he hung on the cross. All these and so many more. You would think as this divine sign of judgment, what they were aware of, as darkness covers the land, not for three minutes, but for three hours, darkness engulfs the world, you would think in the middle of a miracle such as this, people in mass would hit their knees and say, oh my God, what have we done? But they are too stubborn. All that was on their mind on this day was murdering the innocent, sinless Lamb of God. It says in verses 47 through 49, when some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a stick and offered him a drink. But the rest of these stubborn people said, let's see if Elijah comes to save him. Let's see if we can see a miracle today. As darkness covers the land for three hours. They're looking for a miracle, even though they're living in the middle of a miracle. They're looking for a miracle, even though they're experiencing a miracle the whole world can see. They missed the real miracle Because they were so stubborn and so stiff-necked and so determined to kill the Savior of the world. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. You know, Jesus had come to save them and all they care about is, is Elijah going to come down out of heaven and save Jesus? It was their stubbornness that kept them from repenting and receiving salvation. 
What a shame. But you know what's even worse, in my opinion? There are so many today, with 2,000 years of hindsight, that are just like this. They've seen miracles. They've heard the gospel. They've been to church. They've gone to camp. They've sung the songs. Some of them have even prayed the prayer. But they have never repented of their sins. Because they're too stubborn. Too stiff-necked. Too determined to do life their own way. No, they're not going to call on Jesus. They're not going to confess Him as Lord and Savior. Because they're too stubborn or too selfish or there's some other silly thing standing in the way. Despite all the miracles they've seen. So they remain in darkness. And sadder still is, they will, if they don't repent and give their life to Jesus, they will remain in darkness for all of eternity. Because Jesus is coming soon. You see, these three hours of eternal darkness that we get a shadow, a glimpse, a just a little taste of here as Jesus hangs on the cross. These three hours on the cross are nothing compared to the eternal judgment and eternal darkness that far too many are soon going to experience if they do not repent. My friends, it is time to stop playing games with the gospel, to stop playing games with God, to stop playing the game of church, it is time to get right with Jesus. It is time to believe and confess and repent.